Welcome to Ancestral Health Today, evolutionary insights into modern health. Today we have with us Dr. Nadia Bataguana. Dr. Nadia is a graduate from the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine. She graduated in 2004 with a degree in honors biology from Macassar University and later naturopathic medicine. Dr. Nadia believes in the healing power of nature, the body's ability to heal itself, and the most important principle of do no harm. She tries to follow this to the best of her capacity at all times. With a strong science-based approach, her focus has always been on nutrition, mostly using food as medicine. Dr. Nadia was born in Mozambique, but raised in Canada, where she completed her studies, and then life took her back to her home country for 10 years. She ran a multidisciplinary clinic as a medical doctor, and today Dr. Nadia works with the fasting method with Dr. Jason Fung and Megan Ramos, focusing on insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome conditions such as obesity, diabetes, fatty liver, PCOS, hypertension, dyslipidemia, inflammation, pain, and more. She's the author, co-author of the PCOS plan with Dr. Jason Fung, a way to prevent and reverse polycystic ovary syndrome through diet and fasting. Dr. Pataguana is a mother, wife, and as we said, a naturopathic doctor. So today we welcome her to our program. Welcome, Nadia. Um, how are you? Hi, Isabel. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Nadia, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your history, so our audience can get to know you a little bit? Sure, absolutely. So I am a naturopathic doctor by training. This is my 20th year now in in uh, clinical practice. I'm also a health consultant and coach for thefastingmethod.com, and I've worked with the fasting method at Dr. Fung and Megan Ramos for eight years now, probably going on nine. Um, I started with them in Toronto, Canada, at the Intensive Dietary Management Clinics, and uh, the FAST program then went mostly online, uh, now totally online. So I've been with them exclusively for that entire time. I've only worked uh, for the last eight years or so I've worked with them. And uh, Dr. Fung and I wrote a book in 2020 called The PCOS Plan, so I'm a co-author of that book, The PCOS Plan, Prevent and Reverse called stick ovary syndrome through diet and fasting. And uh, what else? I'm a wife and mother. I've got two two girls, uh, 10 and 13. I've got two dogs, <laughs> two pugs. <sighs> uh, I live in Portugal at this uh, moment in time, but I was I was raised in, in North America. I was raised in Toronto in Canada. But I'm originally from a uh, South, East African country. I'm from Mozambique, which is a former Portuguese colony. And so I, I, I did live and work there for 10 years before I joined the, the fasting method program. And uh, that's, that's it. That's a little bit about me. Wonderful. So tell us a little bit about what drove you to become a naturopathic doctor. A great question. So keeping in mind that I decided to become a naturopathic doctor at 19. So that's quite, uh, that's, you know, that's young. And of course, um, my mindset at the time was that uh, I wanted to become a medical dog, right? Always, I think I always, at least as far as I can remember back, wanted to be a medical doctor. And uh, that's where I was headed. And then at some point, I started to become a bit frustrated with the conventional medical system, even at that age. I uh, then went on to university and did, I, I did an honors biology degree first in Canada. That's that's your equivalent to your pre-med, I guess. And um, in the midst of that, decided to go into naturopathic medicine because I had IES at the time and it got worse during university, I guess, with the stress and whatnot. So irritable bowel syndrome. And I was really upset with how uh, my medical doctors were treating me at the time. And there was a few other things. And now looking back makes total sense. I had a I had trouble with my period as a teenager. And I didn't like the way that my doctor dealt with me because she thought that the answer was to give me the pill. 
at such a, for me, it seemed like such a young age at 16. It makes sense to me to take the pill at the time. There was no other use for me at the time for the pill. And so uh, I just was unhappy and I decided to become a naturopath. My idea then was that as a naturopathic doctor, I was going to be able to to heal myself and heal others. That's what I thought. Um, uh, particularly my IBS was very bothersome. At that point, I already uh, was taking the pill. And so my PCOS was was really um, in remission. I didn't even know I had PCOS because they never diagnosed me. I guess as a teenager, that's pretty hard to do anyway. But the idea was that my, you know, irregular periods, my acne and all of that was, was in, you know, it was in remission. I wasn't worried about that at the time when I decided to become a naturopath. It was more my IBS, my gut uh, symptoms. It just overall not feeling well and not feeling like I was getting a really good holistic sort of I didn't have a doctor that would look at me as a whole person and say, okay, this is what's wrong with you. I had somebody who said, well, you know, your, your, your bowels are fine. Therefore you're fine. Right. And I was like, no, I'm not fine. I don't feel well. Uh, so I became a naturopath then for that reason. So then four years later, graduated and I decided to move back to my, uh, country of birth because I really left Mozambique when I was one. So I, 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 I can't say that, you know, I had a very big emotional connection to Mozambique, but I didn't have that much else. And so I went to Mozambique in the hopes that as a naturopathic doctor, I was going to work with this theme impoverished community. I thought I was going to work with mummies and babies and learn more traditional medicine and work with nutrition. Yes, that's what I wanted to do, but more, uh, you know, mother baby sort of thing. Um, and that wasn't available to me when I got to Mozambique because of politics and because of whatnots. Uh, I actually was not able to go into the countryside and work with the people like I wanted to. I was told by the Minister of Health at the time that I was going to open a clinic, a weight loss clinic in the capital, of, in the city and the capital. That's what I was told that uh, was available to me because there was nobody else doing it. And I was the most qualified person to do that at the time. And he was correct that there was a lot of demand for it. So within six months, I had zero experience, of course, because that had never been my aim. Weight loss had never been my, you know, I'd never even looked into that. Uh, I myself was a very thin young lady. I probably didn't weigh a hundred pounds at the time, um, 25 years old. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I did that because that's what I was told to do. And I really wanted to stay there. And that's what, that's how it was at the time. You know, yeah. if you, for you to get a, a license to practice, they, they told you what to do at the time. Anyway, I can't speak for now. That was 20 years ago. And so I did. I opened up a clinic and I was very, very busy. And I lived and worked there for 10 years. And at that point, I ran a very large multidisciplinary clinic. And uh, I had a health center. I had a gym. I had a, uh, a pool. You know, it was a, a full uh, holistic center, but it was very much focused on metabolic uh, disease. It was focused on weight loss, diabetes, and whatnot. And I was fortunate enough to, be, to to have such great respect and to be so respected by the medical profession. So I worked with a lot of medical doctors that referred to me and I referred to them. And so it was a really great uh, working environment for me for those first 10 years. Was it a traditional method It was of initially, I think. Well, I mean, I think initially, because I did, like I said, I didn't have any background and I wasn't expecting to for that to be my profession. I think when I first went into it, um, I I looked it up. What's the you know how do people lose weight or how to recommend weight loss and and so in in uh, twenty years ago how it, uh, however uh, that was. But I do know that very early on, I would say within the first year, I realized that okay, this conventional weight loss system is not going to work. And so I, I started to completely modify it. And so then what I did is I ended up going back to my to my studies and what we as naturopaths learned and called detoxes. So it, they, they were never diets aimed towards helping people lose weight, but they were supposed to be diets that were uh, meant to make you healthier and eliminate. Uh, and so uh, right from then, my diet became a real food diet. I, I didn't even call it real food at the time, but if you look, if you think back now with the with the the terminology that we have now, that's what you would have named it. You would have named it a real food diet, 
And so I do think that at the beginning, there was uh, more of a focus on a uh, low calorie because that's that was the conventional medicine for weight loss as it is now. But I very quickly got away from that. So uh, it was it was very much clean food, real food, smart carbs, right? So it was like the healthier carbs. The focus was on that. Initially, I think the focus um, was low fat. And then very quickly, it was no longer, for me, it was no longer low fat. It was healthy fat. So that, and that was ages ago before I even knew people were talking about this. And before I had access to the low carb community in North America. Um, so, uh, and eventually through those detoxes that I started to create for people, and I, and I say detox, quote unquote, because I think naturopaths are sort of known for their detoxes and that's not how uh, I would uh, define it today, or at least not what I'm doing today. But, um, it, you know, eventually it started to get to be more of a ketogenic type of diet, even before I knew what a ketogenic diet was. So it was more more of a fat burning type of diet. Um, I had a lot of uh, like the one week fish detox. And so, you know, things like that, that made sense to me based on I would take little bits from this and little bits from that. And and I had an opportunity. It was a great opportunity. Remember, I was the one person uh, in a pretty large city doing this. And people were very eager to come to me. I, I write about this in my book. You know, they were, they were very willing and gracious and forgiving guinea pig. That's, you know, uh, of course, that's not the way that I see people. But that's really the way that it was. We were experimenting. And uh, over the years, it... You know, I became very strong in that in this, um, and of course, then I started to learn more about what was going on out there. You know, in other in other places, but that was much later. So by the time I moved back to Canada, because I did after ten years, I moved back to Canada. I already had one child at the time and was pregnant with my second one, and I thought at the time that I wanted to raise them in Canada. And that's why we moved back. My little one was two, my oldest, I should say, um, and so then I knew that I wanted to work with Dr. Jason Fung and Megan Ramos. I knew that that was, and I was very persistent uh, in wanting to work. So you knew about, you knew about them before uh, no, you moved No, I knew about them because remember I moved back, I was pregnant. So I, I was on maternity leave. So I, I started to learn about them during my maternity leave. So my, my, my second child was born in 2013. So very shortly after that, they, it was pretty new what they were doing. Um, but they were, they were as close to what I wanted to do as possible. And at that point I was insistent that they were the people I wanted to work with. And how did that finally happen? <laughs> I stalked them <laughs> and they very politely, Dr. Fung very politely replied because that, that was the state of things back still is. He said, you know, they, they worked at a medical clinic, right? In, in, in Scarborough, uh, Ontario. And he said, we don't work with naturopaths because they, the naturopathic system and the conventional medical system have no way of, of really, I mean, naturopathic doctors, at least in my school, we're taught uh, and we look at ourselves, at least I did, as complementary therapists, so complementary. And I worked for 10 years with medical doctors. So for me, I felt like it was very complementary. But, you know, he very politely, I think, lied uh then and I remember that very well um and I did I, I I did reach out whether it was before or after I mean I reached out more than once uh because I felt like I had a lot of very good experience I felt like I was somebody who was very well respected in my country in my field and and I thought you know if only they would know that I that I know what I'm doing kind of thing and that I have a lot of experience and so then we went to a conference. I knew he was going to go. I knew Dr. Fung. So that's why I say that I stalked him because I feel like, you know, professionally, right? I feel like I, I knew he was going to a conference. He was speaking at a conference. Sort of like I stalked you at a you conference. Did. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. And so, uh, yeah, it was like that. I mean, I knew he was going and I was a big fan and I respected him very much. And also I had um, another... Um, group of individuals that I knew and respected well, which was the Noakes Foundation, right? So I was in Mozambique, they were in South Africa. And so the Noakes Foundation 
uh, was also going to Tim Noakes. They, they, you know, he didn't go himself that year, but but a uh, few people that I that I knew and and still know today, they were going to the conference, and that was in 2016. That was the San Diego conference, the low carb. I believe it was San Diego. I can't remember now. It's been so many since then. And so I met Dr. Fung personally there. Uh, and and uh, that time it was just because the people that I was with, he knew. So he knew the Noakes people. And and then it was one of the Noakes people that said to him, hey, Jason, do you know Nadia? She's also in Canada. And he went and he and he kind of did a double take and he went, I know you. He said, you, you contacted us. And I said, yeah. And then it was like, um, at some point he approached me and he said, would you, uh, would you mind coming in and speaking with Megan and I, uh, like on Monday in Toronto or whenever? And I was like, yes. <laughs> and that was it. Finally. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. So, um, tell us a little bit what those beginnings were like, what you were doing then and how has your work, uh, has your work evolved into, um, the practice that you have now? Wow. The beginning was amazing, to be totally honest with you, because it was an opportunity like no other. Uh, I had the time and the opportunity and they had they had the the demand. Right. And I had the supply uh, and they also had the supply. So they had the amount of people at that time in 2016 that were already looking for Dr. Jason Fung and Megan Ramos to help them. It was way more than they could handle. Uh, I mean, they handled it very, very well. But I mean, there was so much demand already at that time. Between 2013 and 2016, the demand for their help was amazing because in the meantime, Dr. Fong wrote the Obesity Code book and it became what it is today. And so I had this opportunity to go into a medical clinic and they had already set up this program. It was an in-office program, but it was a group program, sort of like AA where people would come in in small groups and Megan would see groups from morning to night. It was like just groups of people. And so she had set up this, it was amazing. So she had set up for, so for each person that was vetted into the program, they would first do a full day training session where they would do like a full day, like lecture of Megan explaining the program, which, you know, was and still is the fasting program. Uh, of course, with with some real food support. And then they would see Dr. Jason Fung, whether it was once a month, once a week, once every whatever. And they would do uh, the medical uh, follow-up and supervision with him, right? He would do the supervision and they would get their, their, their blood work done as often as possible. And, and the great majority of these people were type 2 diabetics. And, and um, most... Many, if not most, were insulin dependent type 2 diabetic. And right next to our clinic was the dialysis unit. So you have to remember that we had that constant reminder uh, in many, uh, you know, and, and so it was amazing. And for the first two months, I shadowed these two individuals, Megan and Jason, and uh, I just watched what they did and how they did it. And I learned and, uh, and I shared, of course, my, and it was just a, amazing. And then I started to do my own groups, not only at that clinic, but at three other clinics in Toronto uh, and one of them at the Scarborough General Hospital. And then um, Megan was already doing the program online. And so was I, because, again, the demand wasn't just in Toronto. And if you know about the Canadian medical system, because it is a public system, we couldn't see people privately. And so we could only do it online. People couldn't come in. There was demand. There was requests from all over the world for people to come into the clinic, but that's not possible. And so we started to do the program online and then eventually it just went totally online because we needed more coaches, we needed more help, and there was no no way to do it in clinic, in one clinic in Toronto where foreigners couldn't come. So how is it, how did the program look um, at that time and is there any difference from what it looks today and what have you learned? Oh, wow. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's grown like you wouldn't believe. I think the backbone was always strong and that's why the program grew. If you read the Obesity Code book, which was the first book that I read from Dr. Jason Fung, it's the first book that he wrote. If you read it, 
I think you're blown away by the information. And so the, the backbone was strong. Once you have such a strong backbone, such a strong foundation, then you can see how with the right people, and I think Megan was 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 very uh, key in, in really creating the program that we have today. And so she really was the person that was leading the way in that sense, right? Of putting all of that into practice. And as a researcher, I think that, um, she was very helpful because she wrote the book with him, right? And so the program has grown tremendously. Not only is it an online program, but the way that it's structured, there's a, such a method to this madness, right? As people would probably call it. And so not only do we have a coaching program, but we have an individual coaching program. So one-on-one -on -one coaching, there's of course the group coaching, the small group coaching, which is amazing. I still very much believe in group coaching, but we also have a community. The community has grown immensely. And so the community, what does that mean? It means that if people that join the community uh, cannot be coaching clients or could be people that are doing this on their own with the help and support of the community. There are courses within the community. There are There's a community forum or a chat. There are daily meetings. There are numerous daily meetings with the various coaches on various topics. For example, I do the meetings on women's hormonal health, because that's, um, but there are many other meetings. And, and we also have amazing uh, support on behavioral changes from Dr. Terry Lance, who's one of our executive coaches, and she holds the meetings on all of the behavior and mindset. Um, and there's many meetings for that, because that is so necessary. And there's a whole coaching program for that as well. And then we have master classes. I think master classes, of course, uh, I would say in the last year or two have probably been a very big component of our program because, uh, yes, people want coaching and they need coaching and historically have done coaching, but people really do want, you know, uh, historically we've done two week master classes or uh, more or less. And now we're doing a few of these shorter master classes, like people really want to grasp key concepts, you know, about intermittent fasting, about extended fasting. I've done a master class on TRE, time restricted eating. I'm uh, soon uh, doing a master class on fat fasting. So people really want to master these key concepts. And so, uh, in a very affordable way, in a very, you know, um, intense way, right? They want to do these three day, four day, five day, one week, two week master classes to really fully understand. This and so the method. I think the method the program um, is solid, and I think that that's um, that's been very uh, very helpful and very successful. What have I learned? I've learned. I always say this. I've learned way more than I've ever taught anyone. That's for sure. I learn every single day. I still see clients every single day, so I'm still learning. I think I I, I would put it that way. So. Having seen many clients through groups and individually, and um, your focus is um, a ketogenic approach, correct? Not necessarily. I think our focus, our focus is to lower insulin. So our focus is to help people that have various expressions of insulin resistance, right? Whether it be diabetes, whether it be obesity, central obesity, fatty liver, yeah, of course, PCOS being a big ex uh, expression of insulin resistance. So basically, our focus is in the code, right? The, the obesity code, the diabetes code. The code is insulin, is, is understanding this amazing hormone that we need, but that in, in hyper levels and in hyper insulinemic states, right? In high levels of insulin in the blood, these states of high levels, toxic levels of insulin, can lead to insulin resistance and all the various expressions. And so our focus is to help people lower insulin. The, our therapeutic approach is fasting. So our therapeutic approach is creating uh, fasting strategies and schedules for people for the ver their various expressions. But in conjunction with that, of course, we have to teach people how to eat. And so I, I, I normally follow my five pillars, which is first, how we eat. So we look at time restricted eating, right? TRE, when we eat. So the, the importance of early uh, eating, early and in, in, in the importance of the circadian rhythm. And, and of course, we know that all over the world, people are eating later and later these days, and this is having a major impact on our insulin production. So how we eat, when we eat, 
what we eat. So of course diet. So we do support people. And so people will often ask us that, are you guys a keto program? And we're not, we're not a keto program. Although, uh, a lot of people want to get in a fat burning state and that's what keto means. Ketogenesis means fat burning. So, um, yes, when you, when you follow a, uh, intermittent fasting program, one of the objective, well, it's not an objective, but it's a consequence is burning fat, right? You you lower insulin and you go into a ketogenic state and you burn fat. But we don't necessarily follow a ketogenic diet. Many people do. I did personally when I was dealing with my own insulin resistance. I did start and, and it was the ketogenic diet that actually led me down this rabbit hole of learning about fasting and everything else. So I'm very thankful for it. But in our book, The PCOS Plan, Dr. Pong and I wrote a little blurb about that. So we're very careful to not call our diet the keto diet. And the main reason for that is because the keto diet nowadays, uh, as it is known, if you were to research it, it, it isn't always a real food diet. And our motto is that when you look at insulin and when you look at lowering insulin, your main objective when it comes to food and eating is to eat real food and, and to avoid processed food. And there's a lot of... Uh, potential for processed food in the ketogenic, the actual, the current ketogenic diet. And so I'm not, I wouldn't say that our program is a ketogenic program, but I do think that through diet, you can get it to a fat burning state and we do help people do that. Thank you for that clarification. Um, how do you see women respond, especially women with PCOS to time restricted eating and what is your approach um, especially when uh, the response is not um, what is expected. I think women struggle with the mindset of fasting because, or some women struggle with the mindset of fasting because of the amount of contradictory information that's out there. And when women are bombarded with contradictory information, they feel paralyzed. And so I work mostly with women. My book is written only for women because the PCOS plan, there's... Uh, it can only be written for women that have hormonal during their reproductive years. It's, it's the focus is that, um, I don't only work with women, but I work with a lot of women, um, in, during their reproductive years. And of course, postmenopausal women search for our, our help a lot because of, uh, the inherent metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance that comes with, uh, with postmenopause. And so... What I find is that what women struggle with is the mindset more than uh, physically. And so the biggest struggle that I have when I start working with women with PCOS, for example, young women, is that they say, well, I can't fast. Either because they've heard that they're not supposed to fast or because of the rebound hypoglycemia that they feel between meals. So they have a very hard time with time restricted eating, with TRE, because they feel an hour or two after they eat, they feel shaky and weak and low blood sugar. And so it's this idea that I can't fast because I need to eat. And if I don't eat every hour or two hours, uh, I have, you know, I, I, I struggle. And the reason for that is because they're insulin resistant, right? So the reason why fasting is difficult, and I do think it can be more difficult for women, again, because of the mindset and because of our, our hormones, because we're cyclical, during your, our reproductive years, I think that during certain times of the month, it's easier to fast and during other times, it's harder to fast. And it makes total sense if you understand your hormones. And so we work with women during their reproductive years on how to fast during the various phases of their cycle. So for us, that's simple enough to explain. Women understand it. They don't struggle. I think initially what they do, they do, I, I mean, they, once they understand it, they understand why they struggle sometimes and not others and they learn how to adapt to it. I think initially they struggle with the mindset of it because one, they're told many, many times that women shouldn't fast or that fasting is bad for women. And then two, because they feel this rebound hypoglycemia in between meals. And the reason why they're feeling that, as I was saying, is because they're insulin resistant. Every time they eat, their insulin shoots up, right? And then it very quickly takes away the sugar from the blood. And then they get this big drop in insulin in, in blood sugar and that feels 
that rebound hypoglycemic feeling feels very, um, makes them feel very shaky. Okay. And so that that's an easy fix. Uh, it's a simple fix, but not an easy fix. I should say it's simple as in we understand why that happens and we know how to fix it. It's hard to do because it requires you to actually put in the work. What, what, what are some things that women should look at? If you're an insulin resistant person and women with PCOS are, then you're going to have rebound hypoglycemia every time that you have foods that are going to produce, uh, you know, uh, that are going to create a high insulin spike, such as carbs, such as sugars, processed stuff, sweeteners, flavor, commercially flavored products. And I think that women, even when they try to get into diets, right, if it's a low calorie diet, then you're probably having a lot of carbs. If it's a ketogenic diet, you may be having a lot of processed foods and sweeteners. And so when you finish eating those foods, it's hard for you to fast. And so I think that that's, that that's what women struggle with the most. So we, we teach them again, how to eat, when to eat, what to eat. And then I forgot to mention four and five stress and sleep management. Those are huge when working with women with insulin resistance and PCOS. I don't know if that answers your question, but this is something that we do come across all the time. And, and again, I, um, therapeutic fasting, right? Therapeutic fasting, as in the, the act of using fasting to heal certain conditions is, is the best, most powerful tool uh, to helping women and men with insulin resistance, right? It's going to be the, the one thing that's going to reverse your insulin, reverse your insulin, insulin resistant expressions and lower your hyperinsulinemia the most. Therefore, you want that to be available to women, right? And so you have to be able to explain that to women and explain why they feel the way that they feel and what are the best uh, fasting methods, uh, fasting schedules for each woman during the various phases in her life. But the other important thing is that, like anything in life, a women and men, they have to build that fasting muscle, right? So if you're somebody who eats every hour, you can't expect that person to fast for a whole day, right? I mean, just like if somebody never stepped into a gym, you can't expect them to lift 500 pounds. So it's this a step approach um, that you go into. Yeah, for it is for okay. me. It is for me. For and sure. what kind of results are me. you seeing, especially for women with PCOS? I, I expect reversal of insulin resistance. That's what we expect. That's what therapeutic fasting means. I mean, if the problem is insulin, as Dr. Fung would say, then the solution is to lower insulin. So what I'm seeing in my expectations are reversal of diabetes, reversal of PCOS. Uh, and so that's what I'm seeing and have been seeing. I mean, it's been many, many, many years. We have, a, as I said, we have this large community. I forgot to mention that Megan, Terry, and I have a podcast uh, a weekly podcast. It's called the Fasting Method Podcast. And so uh, we get the opportunity to talk to amazing people, women and men. Um, and so my expectation is the complete reversal or remission, if you want to call it. I, it doesn't really matter to me what people call it. But what I want is to lower, help people lower their insulin to the most optimal levels so that they can have the best um, hormonal health, whether it's reproductive health or metabolic health, actually it's both, right? Because we know because of women with PCOS, we know the tremendous impact that insulin has on our reproductive health, both men and women on our sexual health, both men and women. So if your insulin is out of whack, my expectation is to bring that into the right, uh, balanced level so that you'll have the best quality of life, the best uh, longevity. Dr. Fung's, one of his, uh, if not, it wasn't his last book, but one of his uh, books uh, is The Longevity Solution that he wrote with Dr. James DiNicole Antonio. And so it, it it isn't a fasting book per se, but it is a book about longevity. And so that's my expectation. Yeah, you must be seeing I mean, a lot of babies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do see a lot of babies, actually, even though it sounds funny, right? Because we don't use fasting. We, we can't fast women during pregnancy, right? We can't fast women while they're breastfeeding. It's uh, un not only unethical, but it's just not part of our program. We don't accept clients. 
But of course, a lot of the clients that I see and that we see in our program and that read our book are women trying to conceive. And so, yes, I do a lot. I get lots and loads and loads of emails. I every once in a while will post something on my Instagram, um, you know, always keeping people's privacy in mind. But yeah, for sure, it's we have all these these babies um, and, and not just us, even the ketogenic community, you know, they call them the keto babies. Um, it's this idea that once you understand that insulin has such a powerful impact on your reproductive health, and it's thanks to PCOS that we understand that, then all of a sudden, because infertility is becoming such a huge concern and such an expensive concern, I think the more uh, people that we can reach uh, and share this information with, the better. Yeah. Do you see um, clients who have additional complex illnesses? For example, I work a lot with um, clients with MECFS and now long COVID. And metabolic dysfunction is a hallmark of both conditions. So do you see that type of client? And if you do, what what is the approach? Well, I, I personally, uh, my coaching um, facet of the program I is a bit different. But but our our coaching team, right? We have a we have a nice coaching team, very nice coaching team. You know, they see a bit of everything. But our we our claim, right, is to help people reverse insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. So it's it's very important that that is very very clear that. You know, I always say to people, keep your eye on the ball. So if somebody comes to me and I would assume to the other coaches that says, you know, I have, you know, one of the conditions that you mentioned, for example, and uh, one of the expressions of that condition is metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, fatty liver, you know, central obesity, my blood sugars are going up. Then what we say is, okay, we are going to work on uh, reversing your insulin resistance and your metabolic syndrome. Now, if people feel... And often people anecdotally tell us that, you know, it's improved their pain, their inflammation, which is directly related to insulin, okay? If insulin goes up, inflammation goes up. If insulin goes down, inflammation goes down, things like that. You know, if people's quality of life overall improves, we call, uh, people will will often write in or uh, write in our forum or share in various places their NSVs, non-scale victories, all these amazing things that they will say, you know, my skin tags went away. Well, of course they did because that's related to insulin resistance, right? And and things like that. So often people will say, um, you know, I had this condition or that condition or an autoimmune condition that went into remission and improved. Our focus, what we're doing is we're helping people lower insulin and reverse insulin resistance. But consequently, of course, and like you said, a lot of these things, especially if we understand the impact that stress hormones have on our insulin resistance, right? So if you have any chronic condition or any acute condition, you must imagine that that's going to have a tremendous toll on your adrenal health, on your stress, right? When your stress hormones go up, we know that that has an impact on your blood sugars and consequently it's going to have a major impact on your insulin production and eventually, chronically over time, that will lead to insulin resistance. We often see people, it's much simpler to see this when you look at things like diabetes, right? We'll often see people that say, I developed diabetes after this very, you know, chronic stress in my life. And chronic stress can be physical or it can be emotional, right? You could have a very bad car accident that left you, for example, in a bad state for many, many months, right? That's a physical stress. It's a physical stress, of course, with uh, emotional stress as well. But that type of impact, that type of stress, chronic stress, will have a pain and everything else that comes with it will have a tremendous impact on your blood sugars and your insulin production and eventually on an insulin resistance. It's very common that somebody will develop diabetes after having a very big stress stressor. And so... That's, I think, what you're seeing. I think what you're seeing is that people that have these big stresses, physical or emotional, are then developing insulin resistance and expressions of metabolic syndrome. Mm, Thanks for that. Um, So let's go a little bit. We're getting close on time, but I wanted you to talk um, 
in, in depth a little bit more about the what to eat portion of the the pillars. Um, so you you mentioned that you're not necessarily going into a ketogenic diet. So when do you make that assessment for you know what to eat for what type of client and um, how do you determine that approach? That's a great question, especially because the beginning of June, I'm doing a masterclass on this, um, on this particular pillar, on this one pillar. And so um, when we look at what to eat, many, many years ago, I created a food pyramid that we now use as a resource in our program. And so this food pyramid is based on uh, our insulin production when we eat certain foods. And we don't have an insulin index, but we do have a glycemic index, but people recognize it very well. And that's why it, it's easy to follow a, a low uh, glycemic diet, right? A, a low calorie diet, because it's very easy to look at that. But what we don't have is a insulin index. And the reason for that is because your insulin production is actually going to vary quite a bit. Uh, no, it doesn't actually vary depending on the foods that you eat, but it vary, the amount varies depending on how insulin resistant you are. So what, what does this mean? It means that the more insulin resistant somebody is, the more insulin you're going to produce in response to a certain food. And so based on this information, of course, many, many years, and because we don't have, like you have a glucometer or a CGM, we, we don't have a way of looking at insulin uh, at home uh, like that. But over the years, we were uh, able to, of course, understand this very, very well. And there's ways indirectly that you can look at your blood sugar levels and and sort of um, infer uh, how your your body reacts. For example, when you look at somebody who eats uh, something with a sweetener, for example, and then they don't have a significant glucose rise, right? So it's low glycemic index, low uh, blood sugar reaction. That we can see that on the CGM, for example. But then they have a huge dip afterwards, meaning their blood sugar drops right after. Then we know that what happened there, the hidden is that they had an insulin spike. So we know that there are foods that we have a higher insulin response to than we have a blood sugar response to. And we can see that from the drop after you eat that food. So based on this, and because I am very curious about these things, I created a food pyramid. So when we teach people uh, what to eat, it's based on that. We know that there is a, a foods at, at the base of my food pyramid that create a very low insulin response, regardless of whether or not they're high or low glycemic index. And most of these, of course, you would imagine low glycemic index foods uh, will have the lowest insulin response. Therefore, you know, we do recommend for therapeutic uh, purposes, we do recommend a diet that's uh, low carb. All right. And so I think the hidden thing there, the confusion is that there are many foods that are low uh, carb, low glycemic index, but will still have a moderate or higher insulin response. And and, the, and these are the the foods that I talked about before, the more processed foods, the diet foods, right? That are that are that have sh sweeteners, that have flavors, that have you know processed ingredients. They will have a higher insulin response, even though they have a low uh, carb or low glycemic response. So how do you go into, do you use a CGM in order to determine the progression of the, the diet for the individual? Or are you looking at something else in order to determine um, what to we eliminate? Can. I've worked with a lot of people that had a CGM. I've, I've worn a CGM for a very long time, but that is not the focus of our program. Again, the focus of our program is, is to help people. You know, we're a very inclusive program. We don't necessarily enforce a diet, but we make dietary recommendations. If the person follows it or not, that's a whole other story. We don't we don't check. Uh, I mean, somebody could have a food diary, or they could. That that's really between them and their coach how their approach is, because we have different coaches with different approaches on purpose. People choose their coach. I was known because I I, I went from being a group coach to being an executive coach, and right now I only do legacy client coaching. So I only see the co clients that I've coached for many years. I don't see at this point, I don't see new clients, but many other coaches do. I do the master classes. I do groups. I do, I, I do other things, but I was known as being a very tough coach. 
as a very and and people some people chose me for that and some people were not into that at all so it depends on the coach the approach the method that's that's a really great way of um approaching things and creating a program because everyone is different and catering to those difference i think is really important some an approach may work for one person and not for another absolutely yeah and there's a lot of opportunity within our community for you to get to know the coaches and to choose a coach not only do you do we have a, a an intake session which is free of charge but um if you go into the community first which is i think what most people probably do at this point and you go to the daily group meetings or you listen to the different resources you will get to know the coaches and so people I, th I think at this point, when people choose a coach within our community, within our coaching program, I think that they know the coach. They know the approach. They know what the coach is like, you know, what they focus on. We have a coach, for example, Coach Larry, who runs our eating strategies group and our eating demo group. So, of course, people know that, okay, this is going to be a guy who's going to give me a lot of dietary help, right? It makes sense. You know, we have Coach Lisa, for example, who talks a lot about cortisol, a lot about other things, too. She runs our book club which focuses a lot on mindset. So of course people know, okay, this is somebody who's gonna help me a lot with mindset and with stress management, right? And not to mention Coach Terry. Coach Terry only does one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, she's an executive coach. And of course, you must imagine that the big focal point of her program is mindset, right? Behavioral changes. Wonderful. So how can people join the community and work with you um, as a as a program? It's pretty simple. It, you go to thefastingmethod.com program and then on, in the menu you will choose there's either coaching, right? There's the community and then there's master classes. It's there's three options there. You can join all three. You can have a coach, individual or group coach. You could be part of the community and you could do the various master classes as they come up. Wonderful. And can you uh, name the podcast again? It's the Fasting Method podcast. Pretty, what? Pretty, it's all very consistent. The Fasting Method. And you'll find myself, uh, Megan, you know, all the other coaches. And um, Dr. Fung does a lot of Q&As. I mean, he's very involved in the community as well. Wonderful. And uh, how about social media? Where can people follow you? Myself, I am Nadia underscore Pateguana on social media. Um and then you can find the fasting method on social media under, you know, the fasting method handle. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nadia, for this opportunity and for um, explaining to our audience what the fasting method is, um, mm -hmm. your history and how you approach this um, complex situation and the, the very high level of um, dysfunction that we have when it comes to metabolic health and so many people that need help so thank you very much for everything that you do and thank oh, you for being with us today it was so nice to speak with you again isabel thank you so much thanks for joining us on this episode of ancestral health today we hope you enjoyed our discussion on how evolutionary insights can inform modern health practices be sure to subscribe to our podcast to catch future episodes